So what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'm gonna mute everybody. Can you hear me actually? Okay. Yes, I can. Okay, cool. No, I, I was gonna say, I'm gonna mute everybody uh, during our presentation. I'm gonna unmute them for the Q&A so there's no extra noise and stuff. And I guess, should we wait, make them wait for a few more seconds? You guys all ready? Yeah, we're good to go. Yeah, all good right. to go. Cool. All right, so it's being recorded and I am going to start the webinar right now. Once you click, attendees can join this webinar. Okay, start. I'm just waiting a few seconds for uh, everybody to, to get in from uh, the queue. All right, uh, why don't I just uh, go ahead. My name is Johan Telvik. Uh, thank you all for being here today. We look forward to having a, an amazing, engaging, interesting discussion. Uh, focus of our webinars is as always, how we can improve profitability by applying smart principles to our real estate ecosystem. And today we're gonna to look at health and wellness and how we can value the impact it has on uh, the valuation of business and or of the property uh, in real estate. Uh, I'm joined by my two friends, uh, Tony Wines and David McLean. Uh, we will share a few different valuation angles of health and wellness. And after about 30 minutes or so, we're gonna open up the floor to Q and A. Uh, but before we start, let me introduce everybody to, to everybody here. So Tony Wines is the CEO of Turnkey, which he founded as the first and leading uh, brand within Asia for environmental and sustainability management software. Uh, he has widespread experience as the head of Asia uh, Pacific for multiple fast growing companies and has been responsible for establishing highly successful operations in Asia and Europe for both regional and multinational corporations from market entry to maturity. Uh, David McLean is the founder and president of, of Micmac CX. Uh, Micmac CX is a social enterprise initiative uh, which is, facilitates accelerated deployment of proven best practice that creates substantiated social, environmental, and financial business case cost benefits in our buildings and community infrastructures, which is a mouthful for me to say. Uh, David believes lasting behavior and policy change requires engagement and leadership for those ready to explore opportunities outside the comfort zone. David is uh, very well known in the real estate industry, in, uh, especially in Texas, being a founding board member of the Texas chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council, uh, and he's a current chair of the U.S. Green Building Council Texas Best Practices Committee. He's a, also a creator, uh, built Environment Best Practices app is one of the, his products, uh, and he's a co-founder of the Sex Texas Sustainability Business Network, uh, to name a few. And my name is Johan Teldek. I'm the CEO of ESG Real Estate Laboratory. Uh, I've spent most of my professional life as a hedge fund manager, uh, managing large-scale equity portfolios with special focus on real estate and the capital markets. Uh, and when managing money, we always had a sustainable focus. Uh, we cared about diversity, managed behavior, uh, and so forth, the supply chain. Uh, so to me, ESG has always been an important aspect of my daily life. Uh, I'm also an engineer by background. I've always been curious about large-scale systems and finding solutions. And um, our goal uh, creating ESG Real Estate Lab was and is to increase the understanding of all the great revenue opportunities that exist as we move towards a more sustainable real estate world. So that's a quick introduction to all. Um, I'm gonna start with this slide. Uh, I'm just gonna, the way we're gonna do this today is uh, we're, I'm just gonna talk a little bit then Tony's gonna come in and then David. Um, and I think this slide is, is pretty interesting because if we look at the real estate ecosystem we see the the builders, the buyers and users all at the core. Uh, then we have all the professionals servicing the core in the blue. Uh, and what's interesting is that most of us end up in so many areas on this chart. So you can be a real estate agent in the blue, uh, but you own your own house, you're in green and you work in an office, so you're green. So 
we're all connected and we can all benefit from making our home or our workplace healthier. Uh, so the, the core of this discussion today is about us humans, uh, the users of real estate, as well as the ideas for us as professionals working in the real estate industry. Uh, so what, what is the problem or rather, why do we care? Uh, and, and this is a slide I saw the other day that I think is, is perfect for this course or this, this discussion today. We have a built environment that's basically not so kind to us humans. It's to we have toxic water, air, light and noise pollution. Uh, our community is despite us all living so close to each other, full of loneliness and equality and security. And uh, all of us sit way too much. Uh, I'm sitting down now, we're way too digital and we work too many hours. Um, and workplace wellness is no longer just a nice to have. It's, it's basically becoming a competitive advantage, I think, for corporates all over the world. Um, and as employees, we spend most of our waking hours uh, and, and, and a lot of the work we do in the office. Uh, and we increasingly expect our organizations to support our mental, physical, and social health. So. Uh, it's important, I think, to think of this holistically as, as wellness programs can drive organizational growth by encouraging healthy behaviors. And that's, I think, the corporates have figured this out, that if they're nice to people, uh, there's been tons of studies that show a healthy office means a productive office. And, and that's where the corporates are coming in. Um, and then, uh, the, uh, and Tony is going to discuss that a, a bit in, uh, in, a, in a few seconds here. Then from the smart tech solutions, there's all sorts of solutions springing up to measure all areas of health and then wellness at home and at work. Uh, and this comes hand in hand with a better understanding of how we measure health and wellness. Uh, what's the economic value to real estate and how do we define a healthy property? Uh, and this is what David's gonna uh, introduce and discuss with us in a bit. Um, then just, uh, I love charts to show growth and, and, and some of you are, or most of you may be familiar with well, and how they measure the health and wellness inside the buildings. It's not about the green building outside, it's, it's the air and, and water inside and the lighting. And I just wanna show this slide uh, before Tony starts here. And as it's no surprise post COVID that the well building institute or the well certifications have been rocketing through the roof. Uh, and that's what we're all about. Uh, we're, we care more about people post COVID uh, and their mental well being. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Tony. And uh, yeah. Thanks so much, Johan. Really appreciate it. That's a great insight, some great, interesting uh, uh, information there. And uh, I think hopefully I can come in with a few pragmatic examples of what I'm seeing in the CSG journey along the way. Um, <clears throat> perhaps we could just... Uh, Go to the next slide and uh, give you a little bit of a perspective as to what we've been seeing. So um, just following on from your hands, you know, very, very interesting set of statistics. I mean, there's been definitely a paradigm shift in the whole ESG world, and that includes in real estate and in multiple different environments around what does ESG represent. And when we look at, you know, uh, the world prior to COVID, I think everyone was very focused around you know, climate change and the, fa the factors around climate change and how can we mitigate climate change. During, the, during this process around COVID, we've seen a very significant shift in company operations and organizational uh, perspective and really big focuses moving into the S side of the business and with the social side of the business. And how do we make sure that our employees are satisfied within their environments? How do we make sure that the social impact of an organization is the driver beyond just the pure uh, financial gains through carbon mitigation? And around this whole process, I think, there's been a, a, an increasing use of data to try and evaluate the performance of companies, to try and evaluate how social impact on health and wellness is, is, is creating value in an organization. And certainly when we start to look at social, which I think is the, the fastest growing area in the ESG world, um, we're definitely starting to see that certain aspects of a company, such as improving the levels of employee satisfaction, getting organizations to entrust in terms of high levels of medical protection, providing employees with a better life balance type of solution is driving some of these um, you know, important facets in an organization's valuation. And ultimately, you know, ESG and the S side of it has also got to drive a valuation into a company. 
Um, and we're dri driving profitability, for instance, is by maintaining staff turnover rates. And, you know, we've, we've had very uh, increasing levels of uh, great examples of companies who, by mitigating staff turnover, showcasing ways of mitigating staff turnover, they've been able to drive and improve profitability as they, as they minimize their costs in the transference of new individuals and new employees into the business. It's definitely, we're also starting to see that investors are coming into companies they're evaluating the full process, not just in terms of financial metrics. They're also looking at non-financial metrics as a means of evaluating whether this is a good investment or a bad investment. And the mitigation of risk by having high quality ESG disclosure, and particularly around that happy, happy staff, a great set of employees who have been in the company for a long period of time, is a way to attract investors into your organization and make them feel more comfortable about the fact that this company is one that they should be investing in and mitigating the risk in the, in the use of their funds. The engagement of employees and the ability to innovate new ideas to help uh, employees within that health and safety and that health and wellness environment is also, of course, an increasingly important area to be focusing on. And we've also started to see the strengthening of competitiveness. Organizations that have fought through COVID who have managed to maintain their workforce. They've come out of this whole COVID environment in many ways stronger and, and in, a, in a position to actually em, embrace their, their issues around you know, real estate or other market sectors more favorably by maintaining their workforce during that, during that very, very challenging period. And of course, we look at mitigating risk and optimizing operations by doing this. At the forefront of the whole health and wellness side of it, from a turnkey perspective, the importance is also around data. How do we actually me measure the importance of this whole facet? How do we get to value a company through quality data? And that's another area that we that we increasingly are seeing that by pr providing good access to information that showcases that companies have actually performed as well as they say they performed, that's creating the valuation to the investors, um, be it from a private equity, venture capital, or sovereign fund, or even a limited partner perspective. And that's an important facet that is increasingly prevalent in organizations is not just being able to ensure that you're providing good health and wellness, but also measuring that performance in an organization. And really when, when we look at health and wellness, again, these are the, these are the, the, the four key facets that we talk about. Um, when we see organizations that have managed to maintain a healthy workforce, a satisfactory or highly satisfied workforce. There's definitely a view that by mitigating those levels of staff turnover, by increasingly putting uh, emphasis on training, increasing emphasis on you know diversity and inclusion, and maintaining that workforce, the valuation of that company becomes more and more uh, valuable to organizations that are looking to either M&A or IPO. And we've seen this in many, many circumstances um, within the private equity sector, within the investment sector, whereby when they're looking at the risk of an investment, uh, the valuation certainly improves and certainly the risk mitigation goes down when organizations have a highly satisfied workforce. And that's been a really important area uh, to explore. And when we look at ESG due diligence, um, definitely this is a key facet is how well are you maintaining your workforce and managing that workforce uh, to, to the best of your ability. And that also of course incorporates the reputation of the business and the investor valuation, as well as the stock price. Also increasingly, of course, compliance is a, is a regulatory part of even the health and wellness piece. And, I'm, and when we talk about that, we're talking about fairness, diversity and inclusion, adequate training, mitigation of staff turnover rates, uh, satisfactory work conditions, child labor. The, there's a huge multiple of facets that go into this whole structure. And as compliance becomes more regulated, as companies become more uh, embodied into compliance, um, the need to have those, fast, those positions in place and the need to in, ensure that you're measuring that becomes incre increasingly important. And we've also seen, and I think we have a case study to show you on this, that by undertaking these facets well, by undertaking this process well, uh, companies do actually grow, grow favorably and, and grow quickly within that organization. And, and what we have here is just a, a case study that we have of a company that we worked with um, uh, for many years, uh, working with a, a company called CBC Capital, a large investment organization, a large private equity uh, global company. This was a company that we started uh, with in 2015, 2016. They had absolutely no um, ESG disclosure in place, uh, but at the forefront of this organization was the willingness under their materiality 
uh, to work well with their, with their workforce, to try and maintain a strong embodiment, corporate social responsibility with their workforce. And we started to work with this organization to build out a three to five year roadmap with this company to tackle certain issues, uh, certain measurements, uh, to look at the way that they're measuring their, work, their workforce and the wellness within this company. And I can give you a great example of one of the issues that they face is they built a new factory and actually had incredibly high staff turnover uh, within that factory. No one could actually understand the reasons for that. The data showed that they had much higher staff turnover in their most modern facility. And when we actually managed to go into that and understand what the problem was, the issue was around temperature. So actually that, that factory was actually at around 39 degrees uh, for the average workforce there. So they were leaving because they were simply getting exhausted in that factory environment. That gave them the opportunity to, to retrofit the factory and reduce that, that, that issue. And with that came a reduction in staff, staff turnover and a vastly improved uh, and happy workforce from that. So these are just great examples of how data and how health and wellness acquainted with data can help organizations actually improve the way that they conduct their practices and improve the brand and vision of that business. And, and the company that we have here, Softex, after working with them for three to four years, uh, embodied certain social responsibility mandates uh, in their sustainability reporting, particularly around uh, development goals, good health and well-being, which is SDG3, and gender equality, SDG5. They made that at the forefront of their, of their ESG requirement, and they've been very successful in doing so from that point on to the point that they actually got merged and acquired by Kimberly Clark uh, a year and a half ago with a premium valuation as a result of the fact that not just their financial performance was strong, but also their ESG performance was strong as well. And that's where we believe that the social impact side, the environmental impact side, when conducted well and is visible and transparent, actually leads to a vastly improved company and a great example of how valuation is increased uh, by the fact that they're taking good, uh, good ESG data and showcasing that they're actually managing that well. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. I think that's great, uh, beautiful insights. And, and just for everybody on the call who's not familiar with Tony's business, uh, they work mainly with private companies. And that's why I wanted to have him on the call because I think there's a, a line between real estate and private businesses that shouldn't be underestimated. And it's important that we all understand that there's a convergence happening in the world too, that small businesses need to understand all aspects of their sustainability program. And that includes real estate, but there's also all the other business risks. And, and like in this case, Softex, uh, you know, they doubled their valuation in a few years and got acquired by Kimberly Clark. So there's some, some great uh, success stories from, from being uh, caring and loving with your, uh, the people you employ. Cool. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah. Next, we're going to have David uh, start us on, on his journey. Thanks, gentlemen. So um, this is our uh, internalization of environmental social governance. It's uh, now creating a lens that's providing standardized and mandated frameworks for the business case evaluation and the result in triple bottom line cost benefit valuation of healthy places to live, learn, work and play. Next slide, please. And this is me. The next slide, please. So Micmac CX, uh, we were formed five years ago to qualify the sustainable validity of built environment, proven best practice designs, technologies, and policies. These are uh, current solutions that are out there that are solving issues, um, but a lot of it's greenwashing. And um, what we want to do is, is stop that. And we do that through a process of quantifying their predicted. So we model and the actual, so we actually measure social, environmental, financial, triple bottom line, cost benefit valuation in defendable business case substantiated dollar value. So the, the goal here is to never talk about a sustainable best practice unless there is a connected business case available for that. Next slide, please. 
So what is a healthy property? And, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm the deep dive here. I've gone down into the built environment ecosystem, and I'm just going to talk about how the physics and uh, functionality of buildings are creating ESG value for the building owners, but also for the businesses that Tony was talking about being inside a building. How does that uh, impact and increase their ESG benefits? So a healthy building is a property or a healthy property uh, benefit the owner, inhabitants, and community by ensuring optimum individual business and community health and prosperity. So it has to encompass everybody. Next, please. So what makes a healthy property? Well, I'm going to walk through uh, the process of uh, showing you this. We're going to start with quality and quantity of materials construction. So environmental product declarations and health product declarations have allowed us to have transparency into every molecule that comes into a property. And we can now measure the embodied carbon, ozone depletion, acidification, eutrophication, non-renewable energy, and known chemicals of concern. They are all transparent and made available for design teams to evaluate and figure out what makes the most sense. Next. Uh, methods of construction. Obviously, uh, waste minimization and recycling are important. Appropriate safety measures for the, uh, the crew and surrounding um, community. Limited use of polluting construction equipment. Minimize road traffic, minimize noise. Uh, other minimized pollution on site and inside the building, and appropriate quality assurance, quality control, and commissioning verification. Next, interior design, water and energy efficiency uh, decreases the operational carbon and pollution that's uh, thrown into the community, creates a burden for them uh, in both greenhouse gas and for pollution and higher healthcare costs. Uh, increases in individual uh, thermal comfort controllability, lighting controllability, all have impacts on uh, profitability or productivity and healthcare costs. Uh, effective daylighting, effective filtration and air movement, access to quality views, biophilic connection, that is our connection to nature, either uh, inside or outside of the building, and ergonomic workplaces. These are all things that we can do as design and construction operations teams that benefit the, the health and the prosperity of the tenant businesses. Uh, site design, access to mass transit, bike trails, hard impervious surfaces, uh, ratio versus natural vegetation, contributes to ability of the site to uh, deal with carbon sequestration, water, air pollution quality, uh, control, heat, island, impact, recreational opportunity, biodiversity, pollination, community connectivity, and gardens. Next. And you have the operational policies, having competent facility management teams, doing preventative and predictive maintenance versus fix on failure, green cleaning, green landscaping, green pest control, renewable energy credits and carbon offsets for those properties that actually can't. Um, become more efficient because of envelope design or other um, limitations, but actually can buy these um, and offset their energy use. Accurate and continuous measurement of indoor environmental quality is becoming much more prominent, uh, especially um, uh, after post-COVID. Having that uh, unfiltered access to that information by all stakeholders is becoming more of a requirement, a demand by tenant businesses. And now we're able to monetize that indoor environmental quality uh, with respect to the tenant businesses prosperity. And we're starting to see leases being uh, written that will compensate the tenant businesses for poor IE quality by the um, building team. Next. So I ran through it. That's a, a lot of things. It's complex, but it's not complicated. These are things that are that can be done repetitively that we can quantify and we can monetize and we can make decisions throughout that process. But why does it matter? Uh, Tony and um, Johan both um, talked to this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but business tenants want healthier, happier employees. That lowers their health care costs lowers absenteeism, it attracts the best and brightest, and you want to keep them. So you want to a higher retention rate. And that creates better productivity. At the end of the day, your business will be more profitable. Next. From the property owner's perspective, you get higher lease rates, higher lease retention, 
lower operating costs, better access to funds, higher resale value, and a higher reputation. Next. And finally, with the community, every time we uh, decrease the pollution and the uh, carbon that's created through uh, either the embodied or operational uh, uh, infrastructure of our property, we actually, that's a burden that we remove from the community that they don't have to deal with. So uh, we can also create greater, greater environmental quality through greater carbon sequestration, water and air pollution quality, heat island mitigation, biodiversity I already talked about, and, and other things that uh, are real benefits to the community uh, and connection. Next. So how do we actually do this? And um, we have been doing this and we monetize property design, construction, and operational decisions throughout all the life cycle against the triple bottom line cost benefit uh, analysis. And when I say triple bottom line, I want to make sure that I'm clear here. This is the financial, environmental, and social. And when I say social here, it's a little bit different than what Tony says. Social is how is the business impacted? What is the human capital increase? We're talking about human capital within the business um, case. So the ESG lens, though, has really um, increased the um, bandwidth around these conversations. And as investors are looking for properties to uh, invest in, they want some um, verification that the site is actually um, contributing to these ESG goals and that they will do so for the life of the project. Next. So really quickly, I'm going to run you through a um, just a Typical analysis, a triple bottom line cost benefit analysis is an accounting um, procedure uh, based building. This is a building in Houston, Texas, a fictitious. Um, it's built to the ASHRAE 90.1 2004 uh, energy code. It's 350,000 square feet professional office building. The business tenant is looking to take over the whole building for 20 years. It's got 1,500 uh, they have 1,500 employees. Their average salary and benefits uh, per employees is a little over 105,000. Their annual building total spend then is uh, a little over $158 million. And I guess sometimes we don't think about the actual spend that's going on by the businesses inside. We talk a lot about what's happening just from the building operations. And I'm going to talk to that in a minute. So the 20 year lease, actually the tenant business will spend over uh, almost 3.2 billion with a B dollars. Next slide. So let's look at alternative one, a typical um, uh, upfit of a building of this age. We can, we're gonna spend about half a million dollars. We're gonna make the energy savings 40% more energy efficient and 40% water efficient savings not an, an unrealistic expectation on a building of this age. If we look at, next slide. If we look at just the financial impact here, we have uh, over the 20 years, a benefit of over $4 million, next. And so obviously that half a million dollar uh, investment gets paid back in a little less than two uh, point five years. And that's where the analysis would have stopped in the past. Next slide, please. But with ESG disclosures, uh, we're required to look at well, exactly what is happening here with the um, carbon and pollution that's coming up. The big focus right now is on carbon. Um, so we can see here there's a cost benefit to the building of, and of doing this of almost $2 million. And that is the cost evalu uh, evaluation of the carbon that's removed from the community and the pollution that uh, creates healthcare um, burden from the community. You notice that there's just environmental financial, there's no social or human capital impact here of an energy and water upfit. Uh, that's because none of these actually have any health benefits to the business inside of the building. They do have health benefit to the community and that's covered in the environmental number, but not to the tenant business. Next slide, please. So alternative two is a little bit more complicated. 10 times the CapEx, 5 million, not going to have to make it quite as much uh, efficient on energy and water. We're going to use renewable energy credits and carbon offsets to uh, have parity with uh, alternative one for the total energy 
Impact though, we're going to give occupants more thermal comfort controllability so they can actually do that themselves. The same with lighting controls. We're going to give more access to daylight and quality views by getting rid of all of the exterior offices and moving those to the interior. We're going to uh, give better ventilation. We're going to change the set points to optimize comfort and not energy efficiency, increase filtration. And we're going to do a bunch of things to the site to include uh, bioswills, native plants, and accessibility. Next slide. So financially, this doesn't look good. And this is why in um, previous uh, traditional analysis, this upfit wouldn't happen if it was just the building owner looking at this, why would he do this? Uh, that the energy and water efficiency doesn't pay back the 5 million that he's invested. Next. But you do see with the ESG exclosure requirements, we're actually almost $4 million in burden removal of greenhouse gases and pollution. You'll also notice that even though this alternative is less energy and water efficient, it's almost twice the uh, value or benefit to uh, environmentally. And this is because we've offset the extra energy usage with renewable energy credits and carbon offsets. And plus we have created a site that uh, can do a lot of things environmental. Next. The big number though is on the impact of the human capital increase to the business's bottom line. It's 11% productivity increase. That's and lower healthcare costs, higher retention, lower absenteeism. That equates to $12.9 million a year. Or if you bring all of that 20 year lease back to a net present value, that's $700 a square foot. Next. So, why have we been doing this in the past? You need to look at the, the value proposition of the business case from the building owner's perspective, and then the, the, you need to look at it from the kind of business. So if we look at the building owner perspective, 100% spend next. Utilities account for, in this example, 45% of the building owner's annual spend. And in, in the US, it's averages about 33%, but this is an older building, had no upfits, and so 45%. So anything that the building owner can do to decrease the utility cost by making the building more energy water efficient, that all, and after two point years, all of those savings go directly to their pockets. So this has been the, the traditional driver for that. Next. If we look at the spend though from the tenant business, next, we'll notice that only 1% of their total annual spend is actually has anything to do with utilities. And this will explain why tenant businesses have not been screaming for energy efficient or water efficient buildings. They want the building to be good stewards of those limited resources, but it's not impacting their business model. Matter of fact, they don't want to do anything if it has to change their behavior. Next. Additionally, within the lease, there's another 9% that um, it goes to lease payments. Next slide. But 90% of a tenant business's spend goes to salary and benefits. And like I said, that's $3.2 billion over the lease. So anything that we can do to increase the human capital all goes to the bottom line of the business. Next. So now when we look back at that $259 million, we can see how these decisions get made and hopefully we can start making some different decisions based on the valuation, the ability to actually monetize these decisions and to actually create valuation around health and prosperity in the buildings. Next. So a repeat of what I just said at the beginning, um, ESG really has opened up an opportunity that wasn't there before because we are creating standardizations. We are um, seeing things mandated. And at the end of the day, we're excited because we will be creating healthier places to live, learn, work, and play. Next. And that's me. Next. I'm done. All right. You're done. Fascinating. Um, I, I really liked your, uh, your social um, aspect valuation of it all. And I, and I think uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to just uh, run through this real quick. In case you're new to us, uh, you can come online. There's a QR code. You can type in ESGRELab.com. You can have a look at our courses. 
Uh, we have plenty of real estate and ESG focused courses. That's what we're all about. Uh, and you can also join us for our webinars. Both of those are on this site, um, esgrelab.com. Um, now I'm going to open up to everybody. Uh, I'm going to I've just allowed you to unmute. So if you want to ask a question, please do so. You can just speak. Or if you're shy, you can type. It's up to you. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start, Tony, uh, with you in, in case nobody uh, has a question just yet. Uh, you mentioned quality of data, and I think it's interesting how data has progressed over time. And, and this is true for, with David too. Um, and maybe you could take us through uh, the journey of how measuring uh, uh, talent and, and measuring uh, health uh, has has changed over time. Because you know, uh, turnover is clearly the the baseline that people look at. So if the company has twenty percent turnover in a year and they make it fifteen percent. And then there's granularity in that. So it, I think the audience would uh, be curious to, to find out how that actually works. Yeah, I mean, the, the way we've seen ESG data grow in the last few years is that, you know, traditionally ESG was something that was conducted once a year. Um, it was something whereby you'd be looking at operational performance and, and taking some level of information around that and seeing how you perform next year, often related to a rating of some sort, so an, an annual rating. What, what I think has fundamentally changed since um, that to, to present day is that we're starting to see integrated integrated ESG performance, which is affiliated to real-time data. So as companies start to provide financial reporting on a, you know, a, a weekly or say monthly basis, what we're seeing at board level is increasingly your non-financial metrics are also integrated with that data and is being presented as an overall view of the company. So <clears throat> within that, from the say health and wellness side is, um, I, I mean, we have an example of one company that's looking at uh, training by age group because they have a particular issue around 18 to 25 year olds leaving the company um, uh, as, a, as a high level of turnover. So, you know, what is the reason for that? Um, you know, they, they, it takes a long time to get people into the organization and all of a sudden the, the younger members of that company are leaving uh, in droves. And so is it down to training? Is it down to the, is it down to the way that they're uh, being treated? All of those elements have to be in many ways uh, related to some level of data, right? And, and in many ways, when you look at a company, it's, uh, it's complex. When you look at a supply chain, it's very complex. It could well be that you're looking at this information and, and many areas of the business are actually doing very well, but there's some pockets of the organization. And you know, when I took that previous example, it was a factory that had particular high levels of staff turnover because of temperature. Um, how do you actually rectify that? So it's that level of, of granularity and that level of data capture that's helping um, organizations to identify where the weaknesses are and to then react to it. And when you can get to that point of actually fixing the problem, um, you know, ESG no longer becomes what's considered a cost. It becomes a massive uh, cost benefit. And that's... Uh, that's where the data side comes in, but it has to be, in, in our view, uh, aligned with uh, with the financial reporting structures that most of the companies are, are working towards. Sure. And, and, and I think that's what's so interesting about this, because uh, like David mentioned, and I think we know this, the 90% of the building cost for a tenant is, is the salaries. And that's why the, the, that's why I think this convergence between the two elements is, is so key. Uh, and, and, and David, I'm sure you're seeing that too on, on just how people's mindset are changing. It's kind of like, yeah, we spent, like you said, we spent 3 billion. So, you know, on salaries essentially. Uh, so we should really take care of people because not only does it take time to train them, but if they leave within less than a year, then, then you've just wasted all that effort. And that's, I think people are coming out, realizing that, this is part of the process. Yeah, I think it's um, it's really interesting to see uh, in at least in the, the built environment with the professionals that I work with, the uh, city planners, architects, uh, developers, and now the investors are realizing that um, we need to be able to do this. And the sad part is that most of the professionals in the built environment have known how to do this, have wanted to do this, wake up every day not wanting to build a, a code minimum lowest first cost project. But there's there's never been 
a push for the business case that brings in the human capital component. And that is a game, that is the game changer here. Yes. Um, and, I, and I think I figured out how to allow people to ask questions now. So does anybody want to chime in? I, I see a few in the chat here. Let's see. Uh, uh, there's one here. Uh, how does ESG compare to cost segregation? Uh, any, any comments about how to finance the initial CapEx? So there, there are two different questions there, but uh, anybody want to take a stab at that one? Um, well, I, you know, I, I know enough, just enough about that to be dangerous. The, the, <laughs> there's a lot of similarities and all of them rely on a buy-in to a value system. And um, if you know anything about sustainability, uh, it's a moving target. And uh, any investment firm has their own methodologies for determining value. And what's happening right now with ESG um, and you know where does this cost go and where, how do you account for it is an ongoing exercise. But like I said, we're, we're developing methodologies that people are agreeing to and using those, the more we use those, the more they become kind of the law of what that is. So I, you know, from a, a high level perspective, I'll say that's, that's what's happening within the ecosystem I'm engaged in. Sure. Yeah. Um, just to sort of form it from our side, what we're seeing is a huge amount of companies, a huge amount of real estate organizations, companies around the world. Um, there is no further discussion. I mean, ESG is, is, is mainstream discussion now. It's uh, when we started many years ago, ESG was still something new. And many people have said it's a fad. Now we know it's mainstream as a discussion, but the issue is very much about a lot of organizations are struggling to know how to, what's the best way forward? How do we do this correctly? You know, where do we start? We're, huge multitude of different frameworks, whole uh, multitude of different uh, terminologies. Um, and the challenge for many companies is how do we actually do this well? Um, so, you know, there comes to, there comes a point and, you know, uh, Johan, you touched on this. There needs to be some level of education. There needs to be some level of clarity around what's the, what's the value of the business? What, what's, what's at the core of the business culture? Uh, what's the, the key social you know, value of that business? And then focus on that, to be honest with you, right? Because in many ways, you can't, in my view, you can't cover all of the ESG. There's just so much in there that to try and cover every single qualitative and quantitative KPI that's available to you is, 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 a, very big, is a very big ask for any organization. So what are the key uh, e, e factors? What are the key S factors? And let's get those uh, facets moving as 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 the foundation of the business to to move forward. Yeah, yeah, no, and I, I'd add that I, I agree with every everything you said. It's it's a journey, and I think when you, you know if you're a client, if you're an owner, if you're an investor, if you're a tenant, if you're an agent, um, it, it's part of not only how you as a human relate to all this, but also how you are influencing other people in your organization, uh, and that's part of what we're trying to do here. Just get engage people and, and the, uh, improve the dialogue so that more people know because the more we know the more we can do this together and i think that's key uh, uh there was one question about solar and wind and and how that worked within the esg and i think uh just to make a plug for july 14th that's something we're going to talk about then so i'm not going to answer that question to, today alessandra but uh so so come to july 14th and we'll answer that question but you know uh, the question is to to answer it quickly yes you can finance it and there's tax rebates and there's all sorts of things we can talk about but we'll talk about that next time um as we have uh aaron aaron you you have a big question now you want to you you just want to ask it or you want me to read it yeah uh, sure can you hear me okay yeah go for it mm -hmm. Uh, great presentation, uh, guys. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just was um, I'm not curious about the intersection of, you know, digital twins and IoT sensors uh, for <clears throat> monitoring different aspects of, of um, ESG and just wanted to kind of get your perspective on where you see things are going in that direction. Well, um, so it's it's absolutely critical. Uh, there's no sense making a plan if you don't have a, a methodology for measuring success. And uh, most of my projects start with the end in mind. So how are we actually going to measure? If you're going to say this is worth something besides 
determining what the value is, how do we actually make sure that we retain the value? And I think one of the biggest pushes here, at least in the, the built environment, is that investors have all this money that they want to go into ESG rated um, portfolios, and they're just not rated. They're, they're, they're inconsistent. They haven't have proof. So having the, the not just sensors for determining the energy and water use, but we can, like I said in my slide, we can actually at the point here monetize what a design alternative is worth. And then we can actually measure the indoor environmental quality and put a number to that with here's how much money the the tenant business will lose when it's outside of these tolerances and then write lease language that holds the building owner accountable for the damage or you know uh, the loss of revenue because they have failed to provide a space that is not optimized for their employees' health and their business's prosperity. At the end of the day, that's where we're at. If we can do that with a cable company that drops your speed from 100 megabytes to to you know two and you get reimbursed for it why can't we as a business get reimbursed when the space that we're in makes that makes our business less profitable thank you i think that's well said and it's uh it's 45 minutes after the hour and i know everybody has a busy day ahead uh so i want to i want to thank the panelists tony and david great job and uh thank you everybody that attended uh, we're doing this again, and uh, the next one will be July 14th, and we look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.